I'm gone. Can you see me, John? I can. I can see you. Somebody is saying I'm gone. No, you're not gone. I am not gone. Oh, <laughs> kisses, kisses, everyone. Okay, so we've started the recording. And so, should I do this? I'm going to have fun, John. We're going to have fun. Yeah, we're going to have a blast. We're going to have a blast. Tell me if you, oh, you might not be able to hear this. That, stop it. that is that is the song I sent you on Saturday uh, in basically in preparation for this conversation about relationships because you can't buy love you have to earn it you have to earn intimacy and trust with other people and in order to stay top of mind with them on a regular basis you have to pay that relationship forward uh, and treat your relationships like a garden and I often tell people that you learn more when you tell stories and analogies are great ways to tell stories. And the story I love to tell about relationships is centered around this idea of what my wife did with me recently when she took me out in the garden and she showed me this monarch butterfly caterpillar. And she said, she said, I said to her, what's a monarch butterfly caterpillar doing in a yard? And she said, I plant milk thistle in order to attract this monarch butterfly caterpillar that eats the aphids, so I don't have to spray. And I said, wow, what a concept. Do you, do you do that across the garden? She said, yes, I'm planting and building a garden that attracts the right thing so it becomes self-sustaining, so I don't have to water, I don't have to uh, spray, and it provides our family with this wonderful food and fruit and, uh, and flowers. And I said, isn't that what we're all trying to do in our lives is to build a self-sustaining garden of relationships. And it's not about just prospects and customers because it takes more than prospects and customers for you to grow your business. At Nimble, I connect with editors, analysts, bloggers, influencers, third-party developers, investors, advisors, and prospects and customers. And so that is my garden. This is the garden that I nurture on a regular basis. And I, don't nurture it by calling people up and saying, I need this or I want that. You got on a regular basis, pay those relationships forward to stay top of mind. And that's what I want to talk about today is relationships and their power to help you achieve your dreams in life. I am so excited about that. That is something I want to do. Everyone, just so you guys know, we are on the air here for approximately 30 minutes. And then we will, so I'm going to talk, have John so you can kind of see him and hear him and everything he has to say. Then we're going to switch over to Twitter where we're going to hang for another 30 minutes, asking questions, answering questions. So we're just going to do it all, all at once. But before we do, John, yes, I would like to play a game. Okay. Okay. I like games. You like games? This is yeah. a great game. I think you can do this, right? So I'm calling this game Complete the Lyric. So I'm going to give you a lyric. Mm -hmm. And I would like you, Mr. Rockstar, to complete it. I think okay. you can do it. Ready? Right, let's go. I'll give you all I have to give if you say you love me too. I may not have a lot to give. But a lot I'll give to you. Woo! Points for John. Points for John. Hey. <laughs> well, you know, you sent that song to me on Saturday. The first song that comes to mind when I thought about this entire conversation I wanted to have with you mm -hmm. was this song, You Can't Buy Me Love. And did you know that this song debuted on the Billboard Pop Charts at number 27 on March 28th? So that was all those years ago, back in 64, which was, of course, the year of my most awesome existence. That's amazing. I wonder, <laughs> well, it wasn't popular at that certain time. So I don't think I was, you know, maybe a result of that song. But nonetheless, it actually, one thing you did may not have known is that it broke the record for the biggest leap from bottom to top on the Billboard charts. Well, 27 is pretty down low for it is. a Beatles song. You wouldn't think. Back then, they weren't that big. I mean, they were just sort of getting started. And, um, and look at them now. Exactly. Exactly. So they made, but guess what? The next highest leap did not happen until 38 years later in 2002. So I'm gonna give you three choices. You tell me which one of these artists made yeah. that big a leap. Ready? Was it Sheryl Crow with Soak Up the Sun? 
was it American Idol will winner Kelly Clarkson with a moment like this? Or was it Nelly Furtado with I Am Like a Bird? Cheryl Crow. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Nelly. No, it was Kelly Clarkson. You know, I went to American Idol early in the days and saw, um, uh, it wasn't Kelly, it was the, uh, who is that, the, the blonde country singer that won that year. Uh, no, the, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, people, who was yeah, it? Who, 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 I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Carrie Underwood, Carrie, Scott yeah. Allen. So I saw Carrie Allen. Underwood when she was just getting started with this, uh, with that long hair uh, rock singer. Uh-huh. Man, it was so much fun. I love, I love music, you know? And I, I, I think that music is probably one of the quickest ways into somebody's heart and soul. And that's why when I hear somebody talking about something, I often think of a song because songs relate to moments and ideas and I'll send somebody that song. And, and you know, we all relate to our shared passion plan and purpose in life and food, fun, friends, and frolicking uh, and family are the five Fs of, uh, of intimacy that you share with other people. So it's family, uh, friends, food, fun, and frolicking. My, the five Fs of relationships. So if you people are not following John, at John underscore Ferrara on Twitter, and on Facebook, that's exactly what you are going to see, right? So like I said, I picked this uh, Can't Buy Me Love for a reason, and you sort of talked about social, you know, how it relates to social selling. So talk a little bit more about that. How does this idea of not being able to buy love actually relate? What is social selling? And I want to point yeah. out to you, if you're not aware, if you look in the stream, you will see Scott Allen. We, uh, making comments there. He's actually the author of Digital Handshake. So the two of you have something in common. Hey, Scott. You know, Bo should have won. You're right. He's, Scott's saying that Bo Bai should have won. And now he's saying he's singing with the blood, uh, sweat, and tears. I actually go see them just to hear Bo sing again. So you're asking me about social selling. Let's step back away from social selling and just talk about relationships in general and how they help you achieve your passion plan and purpose in life. I think that we're on this planet to grow our souls and help other people grow theirs. And we do that by being present with other human beings, by sharing our, 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 our passion, our plan, our purpose in life. And through that conversation, through that vibration, we power each other to succeed. And that's the only thing we leave this planet with are the moments that we're truly present with other people and building that connection uh, and finding ways to add value to other people. Because I believe that we're here to help other people grow. And if you could help other people grow at scale, you could build a gold mine. I know I did. And so ultimately, for you to be able to do that effectively, it's hard in an overconnected, overcommunicated world. Most people I know have relationships in the thousands, if not the tens of thousands. And you can only manage 100 to 200 people in your head at any one time. It's called the Dunbar limit. There's a limit on the amount of people that you can mentally maintain in your head. And so how do you identify people that matter, reach out in a relevant, authentic way, pay that relationship forward so that when that person does think about your products or services, they not only pick up the phone and they call you, but they drag their friends with them. That's what I want to talk about is how do you do that at scale? And how so- so because you built Nimble, uh, I was talking to Michaela earlier, and she said, you know, we don't have a formal marketing department. Is that true, or did I not understand that correctly? So Nimble has no marketing and no sales people in the company. So we're generating 80,000 unique visitors per month on our website. We're converting at 10% to trial and 20% to paid with no marketing spend and no salespeople, our customers essentially are driven to our website because of content, conversation, and community. So the way we built the Nimble brand is by identifying the key influencer of our core constituency in and around the areas of promise of our product. And we began to reach out and build relationship with those influencers by sharing their content and attributing the appropriate hashtag for their content, like pound sales, pound marketing, pound social, and attributing the person's name. 
And that does a couple things. So what that does is it, it inspires and educates our customers about how we can help them become better, smarter, faster by not telling them how great our fishing pole is, but by teaching them to fish. So I believe if you teach people to fish, they'll figure out yourself fishing poles. And the best way to do that is to inspire and educate them on a daily basis. So you become their trusted advisor. So you stay top of mind with them. And then when they do consider your products and services, then they'll call you. And so um, rather than us writing all the content, which I'm a math computer science major, I don't like to write. Uh, I find people that inspire me like you. And so I share the content and then that generates clicks and, and engagement by other people, plus the influencer who we then begin to build relationships with and then uh, turn these relationships into some type of measurable, uh, mutually beneficial outcome for our customers we help them achieve their dreams by building better relationships. And we do the same thing for our influencer friends like you. So, so how many did you, how many did you start with John? I mean, I mean, I, you and I connected very, very early on, at least it seemed to me that way. How many did you start with and how did you choose those folks? The influencers? Uh-huh. You know, I get out into the social river and I start walking in it and I listen and I learn and I find people that inspire me. You inspired me. And so uh, that's how I began to do that personally. And then I began to use different tools to try to do that at scale. But I found that tools are imperfect, that really your human mind has the best ability to sense and see things that are inspirational and educational. And then we just started to cue these people up into our system that we built where we can begin to share that, that those shares at scale. But ultimately, the more digital we get, the more human we need to be, as my friend Brian Kramer often says, and that it's not B to B or B to C, it's eight states and P to P, human to human. So that means that we need to take these connections that start and we need to turn that into a, a, a human conversation. So the fact that we have a deep relationship is because we've taken the time to invest in each other, to spend time with each other, to look each other in the eye and build the relationship that we have. And so the biggest mistake you can make is to begin this whole idea of content sharing in order to build con conversation and community and not engage with these people, not reply to them, not to then take these conversations into a one-to-one -one, uh, human conversation. Got it. Got it. And I, I think that's really powerful. Now, you know, one of the things that was going through my mind is relationships take time. It takes time to make sure that, that you know, the person you're connecting with is for real. Yeah. Right? Meaning yeah. that they don't just want, well, I'm going to call it like a one night stand, so to speak, right? You know, I get pitched all day. People just, oh, write about me or this or that, you know. Yeah. I didn't get that. Uh, I didn't get that feeling from you, and it sort of mm -hmm. happened over and over. It was just like meeting a new person—a little touch here, a little retweet there. This, you know, back and forth. It took time, and yet yeah. Nipple grew really fast. How did you escalate that, or was it just the sheer number of influencers? Do you know what I'm saying? How did you yeah. take it slowly and naturally, and yet still generate the uh, enthusiasm? At, well, you know, and the uh, numbers. You need yeah. That. Well, if you think about relationships, it's a lot like a car or a rocket ship. Most of the fuel of a rocket ship is spent on getting it to uh, velocity, to getting it to uh, speed. Most of the fuel in a car is used getting it up to speed. Once you're at speed, maintaining velocity is uh, much less fuel. And so relationships are not dissimilar. So we took time early on in building the Nimble brand and, and me building my personal brand and my team members building their brands to identify these people that matter, to reach out and build that relationship by paying it forward over time. But once you establish that, maintaining the relationship is not that difficult, but you do need tools that help you to understand when you last touch somebody and when you should be reaching out and touching them again. And that's why we sort of built Nimble. It's funny, I build relationship tools because I don't scale. I have issues. I have problems with organization and follow up and follow through. And so it's the reason why I built Goldmine back in the day, which predates Outlook and predates Salesforce, predates the term SFA, CRM and market automation. 
I built Goldmine because I believe relationships are critical to your business success and it's hard to manage them if you don't tie in email, contact, and calendar into a unified platform so you have context of the relationship for you and your team. And the way that we scaled Goldmine is not dissimilar to the way we scaled Nimble. So imagine me at 29 years old in 1989 when networks just started. People didn't even know they needed network business software. And I had a networkable relationship platform with sales and market automation built into it. How do you sell something to people they don't even know they need? What I did is I identified the key influencer of my core constituency in and around the areas of promise my product. That's long winded for saying the trusted advisor to my customer, my prospect, who is that? It's the guy that sold them the Novell network, the network that basically ties together their printers and hard drives. And I got the Novell reseller to use Goldmine by cold calling the top 500 of them in the world and getting them to use it. People sell what they know and they know what they use. Then they started to talk about it. They started to sell it. And that's how we scaled Goldmine without ever taking any venture capital or, or investment. Uh, we basically started the company on $5,000. Uh, and I'm doing the, we're doing the same thing with Nimble today. Yep. Yep. And that is absolutely fascinating. I think the people really, really struggle with, and that's why I was so glad that uh, Scott Allen joined us because he wrote a book a long time ago called Digital Handshake. Yeah. And, he, you know, he really talked and tried to educate people on understanding exactly, oh, virtual handshake. Sorry, Scott. See, got it wrong. But um, it was one of my favorite books. It really was because it taught people how to set goals and what you're going to do with that relationship. Why don't you talk a little bit about from your perspective about, um, and, and I think this is what gets into social selling. I don't think people understand um, what tools to use for what relationships and so on and so forth. What is your philosophy? How do you move people, let's say from social to email to phone to so on and yeah. so forth? How does that yeah. work for you? So ultimately for me to connect with another human being, I need context and insights. Context is what's happened, who did it, what's going to happen, who's going to do it. The most important context that you have is email and calendar. The biggest problem is we all live in Outlook address book and Google contacts and they don't tie email, contact and calendar together. So you don't have context. Then you don't have insights. Insights is who are they and what their business is about because it's your job to understand who somebody is and what their business is about to figure out how you might add value to them. Uh, because service is the new sales. You should go into every relationship, figuring out how I can help that person become better, smarter, faster. And the best way to do that is by being prepared. In the old days, we basically did that by going to somebody's office and looking at their walls, look at the books they read, the degree of the school they went to, the knickknacks they collect. Today we do it digitally. And so the, the tool set of the modern business person is Outlook address book or Google contacts and Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn primarily. And so if that's true, then when you go to a contact record in Outlook address book or Google contacts, there's no link of the email and calendar activities that you and the team have done, no link of the social interactions and no data on who they are. So you have to Google them to understand who they are. That 60% of your business time spent wasted. And so I believe the primary thing that you should have for every engagement is context and insights. That's why we built Nimble to integrate email, contact and calendar together, synchronize them out of Outlook, Address Book, and Google Contacts so that whenever you bring up a record, you have the history of interactions and conversations on email, calendar, and social for you and your team. And then you have the insights, who are and they what their business about. And then we make it so it works with you everywhere you work. Because before you ever engage in a email, inside Twitter, inside LinkedIn, wherever you're engaging, you should have that context and insights. And so then you can then take the proper action that's authentic and relevant. So if I saw that you had a five-year anniversary at DIY marketing in LinkedIn, I saw that message, I'd nimble you. I basically see the context and insights on a relationship. And rather than sending you a generic message like everybody else does, congrats on five years at DIY, I'd say, you know what? You are boss. I love what you built with your community. And I so especially love how you're using nimble to do the one-to-one -one outreach at scale. Thank you so much for supporting uh, us on our journey of powering millions of people on their relationships, which is much more contextual, authentic, and relevant. It's gonna touch you more. And so that's what you need to do at scale is to be able to connect in that one-to-one -one authentic and relevant way. And like I said, uh, if you're trying to do it yourself. 
And you know, and let's and let's talk a little bit about being at scale because I know folks have questions here that they're going to want to ask you before we transition over. Uh, my question to you is: When you say at scale, what does that look like for a salesperson? What does that look like for a business owner that's using, let's say, Nimble, right, mm -hmm. to manage these relationships so they can see? You know, you'll get a reminder. So I'll tell you folks, I've been on Nimble forever. And I will also tell you, it took me forever to grow into the system. And quite frankly, that's one of the things you might find too. I think what Nimble outlined for me is areas where I was weak in uh, goals, areas where I was weak in um, maybe connections and conversations. And it really filled that form in, right? So, um, what does at scale look like? Does that mean I'm sitting down and spending an hour a day? You know, you're the boss. Figure it because uh, you're amazing. I don't even know how you do all this. How did you? How do you use the platform at scale? That's the short yeah. question. Well, th the thing is, is that if you have to go to your contact tool or CRM to use it, you won't. The biggest cause of failure of CRM is lack of use. Nobody wants to go type data in a database, and they don't want to go to a database to look stuff up or log what they know and did. In fact, they shouldn't have to log what they know and they did. The system should do that. So I believe that you shouldn't work for your CRM. It should work for you by building itself and then work with you wherever you work. And so the way that um, that Nimble sort of does this whole magic that it does is it's not really about automation because you can't automate relationships the way we're talking about them. It takes this sort of one-to-one -one communication, but you do need to nurture them over time, which means that it is okay to segment your database into a small subset and then send them a one-to-one -one message that's authentic and relevant that makes them feel like you're personally reaching out to them. In fact, I did an experiment recently where I built a group of the people I'm connected on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, in other words, bi-directionally connected, and that, uh, and that basically I've spoken to them before, but I haven't touched them in a certain period of time. And I sent an email that essentially was very simple that said, you know what, you're important to me and I would love to reconnect to learn more about what's going on with you and how we might be able to add value to each other's journey. And my open rate on that email was 80%, my click rate was 60%, my calendar is full for the next three weeks with my friends that I'm gonna reconnect with. And every time I connect with them, I found wonderful opportunities to help them. And these people are continuing to help us as well. But I don't go into those relationships asking for anything. I basically go into them to listen and learn. And I think that's what you should do in any engagement is not go into there with a preconceived idea of what you want, but to figure out how you might help that person uh, today and tomorrow. That's awesome. So before we tie this little session up, does anyone have any questions for John? Scott says, can you do a mail merge in Nimble to hand selected list or any tag? Yeah. I'm gonna so, leave that to you. So that's like a softball coming over the plate. <laughs> right. and I'm just like gonna whack that thing out of the park. So, <laughs> so I believe that the biggest cause of serum failure number two is bad data. And you can't rely on human beings to type the data in. So when you put a name in Nimble, we automatically enrich it with people and company data, which means that you have who somebody is, where they work, where they're from, what they're influential in, the name of their significant other, where they went to school, uh, all and their areas of influence. So all kinds of public and private data that enables you to then build segments uh, out of that on not just the data you put in the program, but the data we put in and then send them an email, not from like an infusion soft that basically looks like it was a one to many, but from your personal business email. And then you get signals on open click reply and non-reply. We can do that at scale from within the Nimble with a mail merge and a template, but we can also do that uh, from directly within the Gmail interface. So you can essentially send an email and track open and click with templates uh, directly from within your uh, Gmail as well. So hopefully that answers your question, yep. Scott. And Scott, please reach out. I would love to learn more about you. It seems like we sing you from the same- You two need to meet, you two people. Need to meet when I saw Scott, I've known Scott for years and years and been a, just a, been a big fan. He recontextualized 
the whole social connection thing for me. So you guys are like two sides of the same coin. Cool. So awesome. All right, people. So I'm going to take us out with some music. We'll be back again right here on Blab. Hashtag Visapalooza chat. Uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Mondays, always rocking it out with some awesome people. Next week, John, I'm going to have some folks from Status Brew. Awesome. So if you're trying to find influencers and follow up with what John, John just talked about, that's where you're going to get it. So now all you people come and join the after party over on uh, hashtag. I, 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 have, I have one more thing to say. Yes. Give them the hashtag first. Hashtag Bizapalooza chat. Okay. If you want to connect with other influencers, the easiest way to find them is Twitter. So if you want to find more people like, let's say me, you go to my Twitter identity and you can look at the list I curate or the list that I'm on. And within Nimble, if you subscribe to any of those lists, you can import that list into Nimble. We'll automatically enrich people and company data on those records. And you can then build segments. And soon we're going to actually, with data credits, enable you to locate their email as well and build these one-to-one -one outreaches and communications. So as an example, just go to Robert Scoble's Twitter identity and look at the list that he has on um, press influencers, tech influencers, and go import some of those lists and check out the way we map the data. And I'm gonna give you one more tip because I love this tip. Okay. You're going to a conference and you wanna prepare to engage at that conference. Let's say you're going to Social Media Marketing World 17. You can go back to Social Media Marketing World 16 and get the list of speakers and influencers from the conference, import them in, and begin to pay forward those people before the conference by sharing their content and attributing them, and then reaching out to them as you build this relationship and say, I'd love to connect while we're there. So you start this cycle months before the conference, and by the time you get there, you're gonna have so many opportunities to create so much value for these people that you're gonna rock that conference out. So that's my idea for rocking your next conference. And even if you don't go to the conference, you can attend it virtually online and do the same thing. So there are some ideas on building influence and winning friends, the Dale Carnegie, John Farrar way. I love it. Woo! I have to do anything, my friend. All right, we're out. Twitter time, John. I'll see you at our favorite meeting place. Hasta la vista, baby. Ciao. Ciao.